Hello and welcome to Prairie Pulse. Coming up a little bit later in the show, we'll hear from the Just Friends group. But first, joining me now is our guest, Jim Cornelius. Uh, Jim is the executive director of the Canadian Food Banks, uh, uh, Food Grain Banks in Winnipeg. Jim, thanks for joining us today. My pleasure. As we get started, tell the folks a little bit about yourself, your background, maybe where you're originally from. Well, I was born on the prairies in Yorkton, Saskatchewan, but my parents took me off to um, East Africa, to Kenya in 1955 when I was six months old, and um, and that's where I grew up. I was lived there and um, with my parents until I finished high school and then returned to Canada to make my way in the world. Well, you say that, so how did you become involved with, with the Food Grains Bank? Well, I, in university, I had studied international development, was very interested in working on international development issues, and, um, and had developed a consulting practice around it, working with different non-governmental organizations, the Canadian government on issues. And the Food Grains Bank was one of my clients. I used to do work for them on a consulting basis, and then they contracted with me to manage a project in Eritrea in um, Northeast Africa, and was there with my family, managing a project helping the government of Eritrea establish uh, basically a food reserve system and storage systems. And from there, they they then invited me to come and take on this position as executive director in 97. Okay, so you've been there since 19, 19, 1997, so almost 16 years or so. Mm -hmm. uh, but let's back up just a minute. You mentioned a little bit, but what is the Canadian Food Grains Bank? Well, it's a partnership of 15 Canadian church agencies, national church agencies in Canada, that are working together to end global hunger. We, um, we have a very um, big but simple mission of trying to address hunger around the world, to reduce it with the ultimate vision of saying we can, we can end hunger. Yeah, now, uh, I understand it was started back in, in 1983. Mm -hmm. Can you talk more about the history? And uh, it, It's a pretty simple mission, but a, bit, <laughs> but a pretty uh, yeah. tough mission, too. Yeah, I mean, we were officially formed in 1983 as a partnership of Canadian churches, but our roots go back into the mid-70s, the time of the um, food crisis in 1974, and people were wrestling with issues of global hunger there. And the Mennonite Central Committee at that time set about um, the task of really working at issues of food and agriculture and hunger around the world. And, um, and they came up with this idea of creating a food bank. This is before food banks as we know them even existed today in our sort of urban context. And it was an idea where farmers would be able to donate grain and that grain would be made available to hungry people around the world. And so they set up the system in the mid-70s, got it up and running. But they always had a vision that they would invite other churches into this work. And so in 1982, they held a meeting, called churches from around Canada to come to say whether they were interested. A number of them said yes, and it was formed in 1983 as a, as a partnership. And at that time, there were, there were just five of the churches that became involved, and it's now grown to include 15 different agencies that between them represent 32 different denominations in Canada. Okay, so obviously uh, a lot of people involved. Uh, it's coming up on a, a 30th anniversary, mm -hmm. so how, how do you plan to, uh, what do you plan to do for that? Well, tell stories. Um, a lot of it's about telling the stories of the bank, um, just going out with many people that have been supporting it for, for years, you know, over 30 years, and just um, saying thanks to them, extending appreciation, telling their stories to others, and then inviting not anniversary is a great time to invite others into the into the mission, into the partnership. So go out, share our story, and then other, invite others to participate with us. Well, and you say 15 church agencies, yeah. but uh, do you have other partners? Well, we these are the these are sort of the owners of Owner, the bank, okay. and um, and they're the ones through whom we do our work all around the world. And, um, but they partner with many groups in the developing country. So we're working with a lot of local organizations and countries around the world. And so th those are the ones we think of as our partners. And, um, and they're the ones that implement programs in many, many countries around the world. Yeah. Well, now what about farmers? How are they involved and has this changed over the years? Well, initially it was farmers taking a portion of their harvest taking it down to the elevator. And in the early days, they even had to take it down and they, they cleaned it and bagged it by hand and they loaded it onto rail cars by hand. It was a big, big effort. And then we worked out arrangements with the elevator companies in Canada where they would receive the donations on our behalf and do all that work. And so we have agreements with all the elevator companies in Canada where farmers can simply take 
truckload down and say this is for the food grains bank. And then other systems evolve whereby farmers would say, well, let's get a piece of land together and they would um, get a piece of land and then they would collectively farm that land and then donate all the proceeds off that land. And the nice thing about that is the farmers would donate all their time, their labor, their equipment to do this, but then they would go to the local dealer and get the seed donated, and go get the fertilizer donated, get a whole a lot of the inputs donated from agribusiness, and so it became a major community effort. And then they would go to the urban churches sometimes and say, can you help out with some of the costs of this project? And so you would get urban churches partnering with rural communities, and so it's become a big community effort, growing crops all across Canada. Well, that, that's what I was about to say, boy, it's really a, a big community effort. You, yes. you took the words out of my mouth. <laughs> but do, do you have these arrangements beforehand with farmers, or do farmers just sort of do this on their own, or maybe you have a little of both? Well, initially it was farmers just, you know, going out telling the story of what could be done and telling them if you go down to your local elevator and make a donation you'll do it. So as farmers doing it on their own and with these what we call growing projects um, it's really farmers in a community. They get the idea, one or two of them says, we could do this. And then they self-organize and do all the organizing and then the end of the day they deliver the crop to the elevator and the proceeds all come to the food grains bank and, um, and we just offer them thanks and, and some support. But it's really organized at the community level. We're not the ones organizing it from headquarters. Yeah. Well, I see you brought your annual report <laughs> with you. Uh, can you talk a little bit about sort of your funding structure, your business plan mm -hmm. there, and uh, how Canadians mm -hmm. can make individual donations, I think. Yeah, we said we have the farmers involved, but we have thousands of individual Canadians or church churches or groups that you know hold a concert and give us all the proceeds from a concert right across the country. And so, you know, people make individual donations, community groups get together, do, do other types of projects, and the farmers are involved. And that generates a significant amount of funding for the Food Grains Bank. And in addition to that, we have a matching funding agreement with the, with the Canadian government, with the Canadian International Development Agency, which is the foreign aid office of the Canadian government. And they provide us with about $25 million of funding every year that matches all this um, work that's being done at the community level. So it's a great partnership between sort of the rural communities, more urban people getting involved, and the Canadian government. Okay. Uh, what about those overseas partners? Can you mm -hmm. t expand on that and talk about them, and how they get involved? Yeah, so what we have here is with the, um, with the, um, all the churches involved, they have their networks around the world. They're involved, so the Baptists are connected with Baptist groups in different parts of the world. The Catholic Church has its whole network with, through Caritas Internationalis. You know, the Presbyterians are working with different groups, and so they have their own programs and connections around the world. And when there's hunger needs or real needs for agricultural development in the communities they're working with, they then talk to their partners and their partners develop programs, develop projects that will respond to the needs. They bring them to their to the Canadian church and if it meets all the criteria then it's brought to the food grains bank for us to review and we then fund it. And it goes back out and it's implemented by these organizations on the ground. And they're rooted in their communities, they know what's happening in their communities. So it's not as if there's a Canadian arriving from outside trying to figure something out. It's done by local organizations, local people that are working on these programs and we pr facilitate it by providing resources and sometimes technical support as well. Uh, you know, of course, with farmers, crops are up and down any yes. given year. So, I, so how, what's the total budget, or how, how do you, your funding for for your organization? Well, one of the nice things about our program is we actually have a national farm. We have farmers farming in all parts of Canada. So while some parts may do poorly, often other parts are doing much better. So it evens it out a bit. And of course prices go up and down. But our total budget when we look at donations coming in from, from farmers and Canadians and churches within the federal government is around 39 to 40 million dollars a year. And then we are making that available through our, through our structures to partners around the world and usually about 30 different countries in a, in a typical year. Okay. I'll talk about the need, uh, I, I guess, uh, to feed hungry people overseas. Where is the need the greatest? Well, that changes, of course, okay. because um, 
um, you'll have situations where there's um, often a shock to the system. It could be a mm -hmm. drought. So, so this last year you had a major drought in West Africa in the Sahel region, which is this band just below the Sahara Desert. And they had a huge drought, and so a large part of our response went into that area. But just this, by the end of the drought this year, they had relatively good rains. So this year they're not facing nearly the crisis they did the last year. So we, we will not be having as big a program there. And in the previous year, or previous two years ago, East Africa had faced a major drought, and so we'd had a large response there. A few years ago, we had big response into Pakistan following widespread flooding in Pakistan. So our, our responses to the emergency needs moves around, but our development um, responses often will stay in a community supporting those people on longer term development programs and they will be more constant over time because you're trying to work at the long term so you engage with the community for four, five, six years at a time. Right. Yeah, you know, so, so obviously you talk about shocks to a region yeah. and things like that, but, but uh, how much is this ongoing? I mean, we've, we've heard of food banks, obviously, for mm -hmm. years in the U.S. Yeah. and in Canada, mm -hmm. and you think that we've been addressing this problem. So yeah. ha have we made an impact over the years? I mean, what, what, how can you respond to that? Well, I think we have. Now, there's still a large amount of hunger. There's still, you know, over 800 million people in the world that are considered to be hungry and a... Uh, every year, um, but those people often who, who's in that 800 million can change from time to time. Mm -hmm. And if we go back even um, you know 30 years ago to to when the Food Grains Bank was um, formed, we were talking about um, you know 25 to 30 percent of the world's population being hungry. That has fallen now to under under 16 percent. So the world has made tremendous progress in terms of the prevalence of hunger. And there are some countries where we would have been involved with that we're not involved with anymore because the hunger rates have fallen quite significantly. So we're 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 optimistic that further progress can be made. But this didn't just happen by chance. It happened because of large efforts by local communities working at it, by national governments putting in place good policies, by support from outside aid agencies, and also putting in place some safety net systems. Because just two years ago in East Africa, for instance, they had a very deep drought in East Africa. And it was in many ways worse than the drought that led to the Ethiopia famine in the, in the mid um, early 80s. Mm -hmm. But we did not have famine in Ethiopia two years ago because the national government, supported by aid agencies, had put in place a safety net system. You identified the need was there early, you got food in on time, and it stopped it from turning into famine conditions. So a lot of progress has been made. That's great. That's great. How much food does uh, the Canadian you know, uh, Food Grains Bank, I have to get all that out, donate mm -hmm. and administer on a yearly basis? It varies from time to time, but I would say typically around 40,000 tons of food is being made available to, to communities around the world. And in addition to that, we are involved with nutrition programs, agricultural development programs to work with communities to, to strengthen their, um, their, their ability to feed themselves. And an interesting story there, just this last um, June I was in Ethiopia at a community where we had provided food assistance in 1986. Shortly after the famine, we were still working with that community, but as part of that food assistance, we helped them develop a water diversion scheme. Was, they work for, in exchange for food, put in a water diversion scheme that is now irrigating at that point 200, about 200 acres of, of land. It is now, they, the community has expanded it to over 600 acres. They have not needed food aid in mm -hmm. 20, over 20 years because of this irrigation scheme that's allowed them to produce their own and high value you go into it, it's like an oasis there's fruit trees and all sorts of crops growing that they sell in the local market to buy the grains they need wow so you get to see the fruits of your labor from time to time well it's rare to get back to community some 25 plus years later after the work that had been done i mean often you're there right at the end of a project or a few years later but to go back that many years and still see the scheme functioning the community thriving is very encouraging uh, t talk a little bit about uh, farming in Canada and, yeah. and, and the industry there. Well, just like in the United States of America, farming has, has really changed a lot. Um, the size of farms are much, much bigger and, um, and that's one of the challenges we're facing even as there's sort of fewer, while the same amount of land is still in production, the numbers of farmers are shrinking as, as farmers get, get bigger, but we're 
we're still amazed by the level of support that comes from the farming community for the Food Grains Bank. And, um, and also the diversification of, of commodities. If you look particularly on the prairies here, I mean, there's just a wa much wider um, variety of commodities. In the early days, you know, it was, you know, wheat was such a big, big part of the production system. So much of our, our system was built around wheat. And um, now the, the, the different varieties of crops you know, farmers are growing. Um, our program has had to adapt to that as well. Okay. Now, you said your mission was to end global hunger. Yeah. Uh, it sounds like most of your efforts are overseas. Do you have any efforts in Canada? No. Oh. Our, we're, we've been set up by the Canadian okay. churches to work on the international side. Okay. The churches, as you well appreciate, have lots of hunger programs they're working on in mm -hmm. their own communities, in their own neighborhoods in, in Canada. And so they work through their other, those programs. But for the international side, they, they work with the Food Grains Bank to help resource them. Sure. Now, how many volunteers, employees uh, do you have? And, and are volunteers important to you? Well, they're usually important. In terms of employees, we have about we have about 30 employees, um, um, and then we have all these projects across the country done by farmers, by community groups. It's all run by volunteers, and um, and part of our job is just to support their efforts. It's um, thousands of people across the country, and and then you they'll often in a growing project get together on a harvest day, and everybody will show up, and they'll throw a barbecue and invite all the kids, and for combine rides, and um, as a way of celebrating sort of the community effort. But it's really based on volunteers at the community level. Well, and so. How can people get involved with your organization? Well, if they're a farmer, it's very easy. You can just take a truckload down the elevator. They all have our systems. But for other organizations, just best thing to do is go to our website. We have lots of information of how you can get involved at uh, www.foodgrainsbank.ca. It's real simple and lots of opportunities for people to get involved. And, um, and um, anyone's watching this show and they just want to call up and talk to me, I'm always happy to take their call. Yeah. What's the most satisfying part of your job? Two things. Um, one is just getting out and meeting with the volunteers. Sometimes, you know, as you know, administrative work and there will be challenges and problems and funding issues and you, you know, you get down a little bit and if I ever want to just get an energy boost, I go out go out and meet with our volunteers who are just so committed and, um, and the, you, know, you just come back ready to go again. And then the other thing is getting to the field, seeing the programs that we're supporting and seeing the difference it's making in people's lives. Um, and you're talking to, you know, a widow recently, I was in, um, in, in Niger um, where this um, real drought was and a widow, she'd been recently widowed, she had children who had, had not had enough to eat. But now I was there for the second food distribution, and she said before the food is coming, coming, her children didn't have enough energy even to play. Right, their play was down. She really noted that, and the amount of food she could provide them, and she was so thrilled with the food, and she was pointing to her children, saying, "Look, they're they have the energy to play, and sort of life is good um, for her." And and she was going to get through this difficult time, and then once the rains come, she can get back on her feet and get going again. That's also very very um, satisfying. Hmm. Yeah, I'm sure it would be. You mentioned the, the Canadian Wheat Board, I think, just a moment ago. How, how important is that relationship? In the early years, it was vital because much of what was being grown on the, on the prairies was um, wheat and all of that was being marketed through the Canadian Wheat Board. Um, and so a key part of the development of the Food Grains Bank was developing an agreement with the Wheat Board to facilitate all these donations. And we've had very good working relationship with the Canadian Wheat Board over many years. The marketing system in Canada has changed in the, in the last two years with the Wheat Board um, no longer sort of marketing all of wheat. So it's, it's not as important as it used to be, but it still is a very important relationship for us. Mm -hmm. I understand you call this mission a Christian response to hunger. Mm -hmm. What does that mean to you? Well, I think it goes back to the commands of, of Jesus, who had, who basically said to you know to his disciples and to those that he was with, that um, if you see someone hungry, make sure you provide them something to eat. And by doing that, as if you were doing it to me. I mean that's sort of very central to the Christian faith. If there's someone in need, you reach out and do that. And there's so many of the stories. The story of the good Samaritan, right? Who is my neighbor? Well. That story said, my neighbor is not just the one who lives right next door, but it's also the Samaritan who I stop and help. And so we think of this as a global village, a, glo you know, a global family. So 
Canadians are reaching out to someone in, in Niger and West Africa, they're actually reaching out to a neighbor as, as per the instructions of, uh, of, of Jesus himself. And so that's how we understand it as being a, a Christian response to hunger. Well, Jim, what does the year look like? And then maybe a little bit about what are your goals? I mean, obviously the, the, your major goal is there, but what <laughs> yeah. are your goals for the next few years? Well, it's to continue to um, expand our um, support base. And we're doing a lot more to reach out to urban. Canadians. So we've had this strong rural base. We don't want that to go away, but we also know that uh, most Canadians live in cities or in some sort of urban setting, and so we're doing more to reach out to, um, to, um, to, to urban Canadians. And we're working very hard at strengthening the quality of our programs, making sure our programs are as well designed as possible because you know, we have limited resources and we want to make sure they're going as far as po possible. So we constantly are examining our programs to say, is this the most effective way? So recently, we used to send a lot of food from Canada. Now we purchased almost all the food more closer to the area of need, so it benefits local farmers. Jim, real quick, that website where people can go to get more information. www.foodgrainsbank.ca Jim, thanks so much for joining us today. You're welcome. Stay tuned for more. Mark Venz is an acclaimed poet and retired professor at Minnesota State University, Moorhead. He describes his poetry as a way of seeing and a way of discovering. Recently, he visited our studio to recite some of his poetry and was joined by area jazz musicians. They call themselves Just Friends. in his underwear. For God's sake, his mother always told him, never go out with holes in your underwear. What if you were in an accident? She was a good and dutiful mother and could be proud. He was always equipped with the best fruit of the loom, spotless, bleached, even starched. But then he went off to college and began to forget everything she had labored so long to teach him. And one day, he was in a terrible car wreck. When the surgeons gathered in the emergency room, they were amazed to find that not only was his underwear in shreds, he hadn't washed behind his ears or brushed his teeth. This would be a case for the medical journals. His poor mother was bereft. How could she face the rest of her life with the knowledge she failed him so miserably. It was right there in the AP press release. Her name, the mother whose son was in an accident with holes in his underwear. My original favorite piece was sleeping in. At the, the time we were starting to do that, you know, my kids were sort of going through that stage. And I think you can hear the sounds and smell the sounds of summer and cut lawns and <laughs> hear the sounds of dogs barking and people working. Yeah. And your son or daughter, who you can't get out of bed <laughs> for, the, for, for the life of you. And it's so, uh, and even remembering back further when you were that character. Yes. Yes. You yeah. know, you were that character. And just the, the, you know, the immediacy of all the sounds <laughs> and smells. Yeah, that one, that one really lit it up for me. <laughs> that was really That's a beauty. Great. Yeah. sleeping till noon. Upstairs, my daughter lies swaddled in her bed sheets like an eastern princess. Good sleeping weather last night. Any summer night is good for her. Lawnmowers, barking dogs, phone calls, the man next door scraping paint to raucous music. None of it matters to her, and I won't wake her either, not for anything less than the second coming. Not till noon, anyway. That's when my father's voice takes over. I can't help it. 
When I grew up, certain things were always held sacred. Long distance calls, cleaning your plate, getting up at a decent hour. But let's face it, I don't sleep so well anymore, no matter what my intentions. Sunlight shakes me like there's something urgent I've forgotten. Alarm clocks follow me into every room. So sleep well, daughter. Sleep well for both of us on this fine summer morning. I'll take the phone off the hook. Go outside and speak to birds and garbage trucks. And when we meet on the stairs, it will be with guilty smiles. Here's one thing at least I haven't managed to forget. Good morning, daughter. And yes, indeed, it was. Well, that's all we have on Prairie Pulse for this week. And as always, thanks for watching. Funded in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund, with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. And by the members of Prairie Public.